Um, well, I worked in this uh, factory doing um, welding, uh, electric welding, and gas welding. And, um, but uh, there was, um, I was going to actually quit the job that day because I'd got, a, I've, I've got a, an offer to join a bank to go to Germany, which was for me was fantastic, you know, to be able to leave and, and, and do what I wanted to do, be in a band. Um, so uh, on my last day, I went home for lunch and my mum said, uh, I said, I'm not going to go back this afternoon, I'm going to sort of, you know, she said, you go back and finish the job properly and leave like, like you should. So I went back to the factory and the person, they used to send stuff down to me, uh, the, the big press and the press, uh, the, the metal and send it down to me. And then I'd weld it. Anyway, this person didn't come in on the afternoon, so they put me on this machine, which I had no idea what it was, the work before. Otherwise, I'd have been out of the job. So they had me do this on the machine. And I, as I put my hand in to bend the metal, the machine came down. And of course, trapped my fingers. As I pulled my hands back, I pulled the ends of the fingers off. Um, so that was sort of, as far as I was concerned, then the end. You know, devastated. That was maybe my last day and I go in and that happened. Um, and I went to the hospital and they said, well, you might as well give up, you'll never play again. So, um, you know, I was really down and depressed and, uh, and the manager of the factory brought me a, a CD, well, a CD, it was an EP of uh, Django Reinhardt. And uh, I'd never heard of Django Reinhardt at that time. And he said, well, you know, um, put, the, put, put it on and have a listen. And I went, no, nah, no, nah, I don't want to, you know. And he said, just put it on. And I uh, put it on. And, yeah, it's, it's really crazy. And he told me the experience that Django had. He lost the use of his two fingers. And um, it really inspired me to, to, to carry on and do stuff. And, uh, and so I went to the hospital and they couldn't do anything. So I made my own tips, basically, as you've seen them many times. And um, I made them out of a fairy liquid bottle, I melted it down into a ball, and then I got a hot solder in it and made a hole in it until it fit over the finger. And then I just sat there for weeks just rubbing it down to shape like a finger. And um, and then I wanted to go, it, 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 because it was plastic, it just slipped off the string, so I had to have uh, something to grip the string. So I tried different materials, and it turned out at the end of the day it was leather. So I ended up cutting one of my old rocker leather jackets up, which, is, which I was really devastated to lose it. But I cut it up, made these leather bits, and, uh, and uh, I've used that ever since, and still do the same thing now, and I've still got about that much left of the leather jacket. <laughs> <laughs> is, is that the way that the Grace um, story is? Uh, they probably were quite right, the godfather of heavy metal and the founder of it all. Is that where the sound came from, or was that a different situation? Well, I think really <clears throat> it made me. Uh, I had to learn a different way of playing, so it was a different. I couldn't play the way. Conventional way, and I couldn't play a proper chord like I could before the accident. So I had to um, come up with trying to make the biggest sound for, for what I've got, you know, which was playing with two fingers for a while because the others were badly stuck. And I got to use the two the outside near the little finger and the first finger uh, a lot. So um, uh, really, uh, the idea was to make the sound really full. And Giesel would play much the same as I'd play uh, uh, and bend the strings with it. And um, it just created the sound that we liked, and, and that sort of went up, really. Just quite dwell for a minute about how you all started. So, you're all Birmingham lads, and you're playing in various bands. And um, Oz, um, it was the name Black Sabbath, I think, came from Geezer, if I'm right, because he was big into Ho Holst Planet classical stuff and Mars and and he was into occult which was obviously the 
the religious side of the room. The, uh, I looked it up this morning actually, yeah. <laughs> supernatural, black magic, sorcerer, devil worship, witchery. So I presume with the name as well, it was an unusual, obviously, style of music. And, and was it all formed around that? Well, I'll go back to before that when we were called Earth. We called ourselves Earth. <clears throat> and um, we'd done a few gigs in Germany and Europe and whatever. And we came back to England and had this gig in England. And we turned, uh, we turned up at this place and the, 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 the doormen had all got the bow ties on and everybody was sort of got bow ties on and suits. I mean, this is weird, a weird sort of gig for us. Because as we were like really scruffy and in a lung game and everything. And uh, the guy said, uh, as we, we, we used to carry our own equipment in there, he said, Oh, I really like your new record. I went, Oh, thanks. I mean, we hadn't done a record at that time. <laughs> and it um, never dropped at all. So we got in, got the gear set up, and uh, we started seeing people coming in in boring dresses and all sorts of stuff, blokes in bow ties. And, this is, what's going on? Anyway, it turns out we, there was another band called Earth and they booked us and we were the wrong Earth. <laughs> so um, it was disastrous. They, they said, well, you, you, you know, we've got no band, you're going to have to go and play. So we go on and we, we made about half a song. We died a death. And uh, so basically they, they threw us off. And... Um, we never got paid on it. And they said, that's it. We're never going to do this again. We're going to get a name that nobody else is going to have. And that's sort of how it started. And, uh, and we were rehearsing one day in Aspen. And Giza, what, Giza said, uh, what about calling it Black Sabbath? And, oh, yeah, that's a, that's a good idea. You know, nobody, that's a name nobody else is going to have. And that's sort of how we started. And we wrote a song called Black Sabbath, which was, you know, the second song we'd ever written. The first one was called Wicked World. And the next one was Black Sabbath, which then made the benchmark of where we were going for the next 50 years. Um, and that's sort of how it started. So, um, did you guys, well, first of all, just to answer that question, why that style of music, the, the deep, dark stuff? Well, to us, we liked it. We were, it was a, an industrial sort of sound, which is probably because of our background, you know, where we come from. Um, and uh, it appealed to us. We weren't, we didn't like playing, we wouldn't play pop stuff and, uh, and, and commercial stuff. We weren't into that. We, we wanted something that was, that was our own. And basically, we did blues. And it came from the blues, and we, we went from doing blues stuff into writing our own songs and uh, so we'd have a, a few blues clubs that we play and we wrote these two songs, Wicked World and Black Sabbath and we said, oh, she would try them at, the, at this club and oh, shall we, you know. And uh, we started playing them and everybody sort of looked at them <laughs> and we thought, oh my God, do they like it or not? And then they came up afterwards and said, what was that song? And we loved it. And we thought, great, there's people just liking what we're playing. And then so we, it went from that strength to strength, you know, and uh, that's how it sort of all kicked off, and we never looked back. So, um, you, I think it's fair to say you wrote the music from the gut. It was written pretty quickly in those days. It, you, it wasn't sort of sat down and planned. It was from the gut, a lot of it around your riffs. Is that that fair comment? Yeah? Yeah. And, and you wrote a lot of it, but I think you don't read music, so how did you write it? How did it happen, and how do you remember it all? I'm clever. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, um, I couldn't read music, and I, I really didn't want to learn music, really, because I didn't want to play things exactly the same as it's written down. Because music to me is feel, and from the heart and from the soul. And, and that's how we've tried to present Black Sabbath music, is is to, when I come up with a riff, you could, you, you know, if you're in a rehearsal room, you never play it exactly the same. Nobody plays everything exactly the same. But if you're reading music, you play it exactly the same. 
So we wanted it to be free and have a feel and a vibe. And so when I'd put a riff together, and usually I'd, I'd do it on the spot, you know, be at a rehearsal room. And I'd come up with a riff and everybody go, oh, I like that. And then, because in that place you didn't have tape machines and stuff that you could put in one. If there were, we didn't have one. So you'd have to remember what you did. <clears throat> so we played the stuff a lot uh, until we left. And then the next day we'd go in and, and, and try it again. But it all would be slightly different, you know, because it didn't quite go like that. But that's sort of how we did it. So in those early days, you went to a three star, it was a, a star club where the Beatles. Have the Indian rest of you never plenty of those. Um, the Star Club in Germany. Now, whereas the Beatles and everybody went there, I don't think you played in the afternoon. I don't think there were too many people as there were. <laughs> well, when we got to the Star Club, we, we were, I think we were there for like three weeks or something like that. And we got there and there was like four people. <laughs> and uh, it was really great. Um, but we had to play. We had to play seven 45 minute spots a day, which was a lot. Considering we never had enough to do 45 minutes. Uh, so, you know, the other six spots would be sort of trying to make things up. So we'd, we'd repeat, repeat some of the songs we played in the first set, and then throw bits in from making ideas and riffs and stuff. And they become London gems. And that's really how some of the other songs came about. War Picks came about as a jam. Um, and uh, so it sort of worked, you know. Uh, but the Star Club for us, and we built up a great following there. And we, and we actually beat the, the Beatles record, which for us at that time was, wow, bloody hell, we can't believe it. Uh, but it was, a, it was a great starting point for us to be to be there because we couldn't get work in England because of what we did. So we went to, to uh, Germany to, um, and Europe, basically, to, to start. Oh yeah, one of the, yeah, we did play at this club in Zurich in the same situation, you know, there was a, there was a small club, there was a farm there, with the stages in it, the bars are out where this panel is here, and we were allowed. And um, we, uh, we got on stage, or what was supposed to be a stage, and there'd be, there'd be an amount of like three people coming. One of them was a prostitute, the other one was a nutcase. I mean, because they used to come in you know, every day, this bloke would come in and he'd do a handstand in front of us, all his money had fallen. <laughs> God's honest truth, and he'd pick his money up. Walk, and, walk out. <laughs> and the other one was a hooker at the bar, and then another bloke would come in, you know, and, and we played it to these same three people for a while. And, uh, uh, and, and the same thing with that, it was just not really um, wherever that film is at the time. Grand on there, you know. So, uh, and we did that, and uh, we couldn't wait to get out of this place. And, uh, and of course, because we've been there so long, and I used to do the driving, and that was the only one I could drive out the van. So we had the van outside, and we couldn't wait to leave. It was our last night, and we got out, and the van wouldn't start. It was just unbelievable. So I had to get the other guys to, to, push, me down the, to push me down the hill. So I'm, it was just mad, just absolutely mad. But anyway, we got out. Tell me, 100 million sales later, 100 million plus, unbelievable. Where was the turn? <laughs> what was the turning point that turned Black Sabbath into this phenomenal success? Um, I think for us it was um, mainly when after the, the, the first album we let build up and <clears throat> we'd never been to America at that point and then Paranoid, we did Paranoid and then we went to America on Paranoid of course Paranoid went straight to number one so that was for us was the, the, the turning point that it was going to America because you, you're playing to vast amounts of people even though we were our first tour we went 
supporting, it's quite weird really, because we had two shows with Rod Stewart, which is a real strange combination. <laughs> um, and uh, we went on first, and then Rod came on afterwards. And of course, they would start booing Rod because of shouting for us, which was really embarrassing. Of course, Rod hated, hated it. And then, um, so we done that, and we thought, let's see, we won't be seeing him again. Then we ended up doing another gig with him. Oh, no. And the same thing happened. Uh, but, and then we toured with a band called The Mountain. And, um, and then we started headlining ourselves. So it wasn't long before we started headlining uh, tours ourselves. And they got bigger and bigger and bigger. Well, of course, they were young guys, crazy lot, into most things. And I'm just going to dwell on some of the things that made me laugh about Black Sabbath on tour. I'm going to start one myself, which Tony didn't know until recently I knew about. Uh, I knew about it before I knew Tony, because he probably wouldn't tell the story. I'll keep it brief. They're on tour. They're in Germany. They're in a very smart five-star hotel. Uh, not many people spoke English in that period. And um, in breakfast, four mobile phones, for any direct dialing. Uh, all these smart German businessmen were having breakfast and there was a, a bellboy going round with, with chalk on it, on a board saying, you know, the equivalent in German, you know, telephone call for Herr Schmidt. Um, <clears throat> black leathered, black Sabbath come down for breakfast, of course quite a stir, and the wind-up merchant, Mr. Tony Iommi, spots this bellboy and follows him out. He didn't speak any English, stuffs a whole lot of German marks in his pocket and teaches him a phrase and the name of the person and the gentleman comes back into the breakfast room with his bad English saying telephone call for and points to the board written up on it is Mr. Harry Bollocks <laughs> <laughs> I told you wouldn't have told me so I'll tell you now Ozzy God there must have been some stories on tour in LA and that with Ozzy have a go have a go <laughs> um, oh, we've got a lot of uh, funny stories uh, with the band. In fact, one, one story I was telling the other day with my, my wife Maria and Sharon and Ozzy went out to the Beverly Hills. Sharon had booked a, a restaurant at the um, Beverly Hills Hotel for lunch. So off we go to this bloody lunch, which we didn't normally go to the Beverly Hills Hotel. It wasn't our scene, was it? Really? So anyway, we went there. And we're sitting around the table with uh, Maria, uh, uh, Jack, uh, as his son, and um, and Tony, my daughter. And then this this uh, these two blokes come walking over, and we're sitting there. And as he's sitting next to me, Sharon, Maria, and Tony are around that side. And this uh, bloke come and went, Sharon, darling, how are you? How are you? Ozzy! Yeah, and Ozzy went, who the fuck's that? <laughs> I mean, really loud. <laughs> and it turns out to be David Arquette and uh, this oh. other actor. And it was like, and their faces were, it was just like, it was, and that's a, a typical sort of Ozzy move. I mean, he, he did that quite a lot. <laughs> oh, yeah, one time we, <clears throat> This is way back yeah, years ago. We, um, we, we, our drummer Bill Ward, we, he was a bit of a dirty bugger really. He, 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 had, he had his t shirt on and he, he put a clean t shirt on to go to bed. He'd wake up the next day and he'd put, he'd put, it, he'd put it on inside out to go to bed. He'd wake up the next day and turn it round the right way. And he'd wear it like that all day. And then on the night he'd turn it back round. <laughs> And the next day, back to the other way. So it was like, and that's what he did, he didn't say anything about that. Anyway, we ended up calling him Smelly. And uh, it stuck for, for a long time. And the jokes got worse and worse with him. And we were in, um, in the van one day, and we, we, we went to this place and we bought uh, four gas masks. And um, we had them in the back of the van. It was a joke to play on Bill. Anyway, we got stopped by the police. And um, they wanted to search the van. And of course, they found 
full gas masks in the, in, in the, in the van, <laughs> thinking, I mean, and then we got arrested because they thought we were going to do a rob <laughs> robbery. And somebody said, no, we're a van. Well, why have you got gas masks, you know? Uh, so anyway, that was another story. <laughs> I've said bye to Bill a few times, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, great, great one. Bill used to have this um, mobile home because he wouldn't travel on the on the plane with us, he was flying the flying. He got he built up this phone. So he bought one of these mobile homes and he said, I'm gonna travel around America in that. He said, okay, and he had a driver. And uh, basically, it was an excuse for him to drive around and get pissed, really. <laughs> and um, so uh, he, he did. And uh, the one particular day, they, they pulled into the station because you have to empty the, the sewage, you know, the toilet gets blocked up and all that stuff. <clears throat> so they, they pull into this where you enter the sewage. And um, uh, the, the, the driver said, I can't, nothing's working, I can't empty the thing, I can't pull the lead, I need somebody to just check underneath, see if it's working. So Bill crawls underneath the, 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 the van, the, the, the mobile home, and Bill, Bill used to go through all these, uh, like, um, truck driver sayings, you know, uh, uh, positive on so and so, you know, the way the truck drivers would talk. And um, so Bill turned the knees, bit in the back, he pulls the lever, and of course Bill gets covered in shit, <laughs> and, and all this green liquid which went into the, the thing. And, and Bill went, Jim, I've got a positive on the shit. <laughs> So the, 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 van, the van pulls forward and there's an ant on the bill. <laughs> there's so many, I mean, I think you do it on Gary's Gary's just reminded me of this other one in the nightclub once. We went to a nightclub and um, of course they, we all got, well, I was certainly got soft. And they've got, a, they've got a, 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 a bench seat at the back of this club. And I was in lay on it and, and fell asleep. <coughs> and he had a terrible habit of weaning himself. And um, so anyway, we were more or less the last out in the dorm room. I said, you, you've got to go, you've got to get out, get out. Can you get him out? I said, oh, I'm not getting him out. I said, if you want him out, you get him out. <laughs> he went, I'll get him out. So he, he got his boot tie and he put him over his shoulder. What happens? That was a, because we knew what he did, I mean, he did it all the time, so we knew what he did. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, those, there's so many of you, you could just, Gary's, Gary sends it out more. Yeah. <laughs> I, um, I love them all. Um, just very quickly, just tell us about the three lads, you know, there were four of you for so many years, about what Aussies are like, what geezers like, and, and what smelly villains like. <laughs> smelly. Um, geezer was, uh, very quiet chap really, I mean, he, he, he very great humour, really um, great humour, but, he, but he, he was sort of quiet, he sort of wouldn't you know, make a big thing of anything. And uh, he used to sort of sit in his room and, and he wouldn't see him, you know. So, uh, but Ozzy was, um, well at the end of the day, Ozzy did the same. But in the early days, you know, when he used to go in the bar and stuff, it was, it was different. And Giza, when he got when he had a drink and got drunk, he got terribly. He got he went the other way. And one time we were in um, Helsinki, and uh, we had Ian Gillen singing for us at that time. And um, we we're in the bar, and the bar the barman said, "Oh, we're we're closing." Gizzy went, "Why well, don't have a drink?" And he said, "We're closing." Sort of thing. So anyway, Ian says. Uh, to Geezer, I've got some scotch in my room. So it's beer, Geezer goes up to the end of the room, has a scotch and then had another bottle of scotch, a spare bottle, in his room. So he decides, uh, he was really gone at that point, and he decides that he was so pissed up with the hotel, he was going to blow it up. So um, <laughs> he tried to make a 
the Molotov cocktail. So they, they put this uh, rag into the, into the scotch bottle, lit it, and of course, he constantly tried with these matches and stuff, and it, it wouldn't light. So anyway, he, did, he got it going, and he threw it out the window. And it is a car. It's a car down at one of them. So of course, the, the police obviously look up, and there's not a light out anywhere, apart from this one room. So they tossed it down to his room. Um, so the police come up, uh, bashed in his room. He jumps into bed, pretends he's asleep. And um, he said, I said, he said, oh yeah, some some guys has come into my room and ran over and of course I don't know where he got that one from. There's all these matches all on the window so anyway they, they arrested him, took him took him away. And um, he was never allowed in Helsinki, well, he wasn't allowed to go into Helsinki for a, a long time. Ago, so, uh, yeah. But there's a few of those as well, I mean, uh, same with Oslo, he's done the same sort of thing. So it, it's endless really, it'd be a little nice. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, listen, then, just the, I've got three questions from people here today, which I'll come on to, but I'd just like to sort of talk about the wonderful things that have also happened to you off the stage. UK Hall of Fame. Great American Award for Rock, which was in New York. Putin, in his better days, honouring you. The Grammy, 2009 Rock Aid in Armenia, where you saw a music school destroyed and you put on an act that re enabled that country to rebuild it. Um, and, uh, and obviously, uh, honorary doctor, the guy in the first degree. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, apologise publicly. Um, I loved you in the mortar board, you were fantastic. Um, but Warwick, I mean, how did all that compare with you and Ozzy on June the 3rd, 2002, playing paranoid in front of the Queen, the royal family on, on the lawn at Buckingham Palace, 12,000 live audience, millions around the world watching on TV for the Queen's Golden Jubilee? <laughs> Well, that's another story. <laughs> uh, we, we um, yeah, we were asked to play at the, the, I can't believe that we were asked to actually play at the Buckingham Palace. So it was Ozzy and myself, and we had Phil Collins play drums for us, and uh, Pino Pilati from The Who, who plays with The Who now, uh, on bass. And uh, anyway, we, 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 um, we went over for a, a sound check in the afternoon. And uh, there was a, some kind of <clears throat> problem. That, that they had fireworks that they were going to let off on the night. Um, and somebody had lit, or somehow or other, one of these fireworks got lit, and the whole bloody lot went up in one of the rooms. And there's like commotion, like you wouldn't believe. So they got us out all out on the lawn, we were all standing there. <clears throat> anyway, they managed to sort it all out. And uh, we, we did the gig. Well, we'd done the gig by the time but we went back to the hotel and stayed the night. That's it, we stayed the night. And the fire alarms went off. I thought, oh no, please leave the room, please leave the room. So we, we all got down, everybody's coming in, dressing down, and got into the house, just down the outside. And as we were walking out of our room, we saw the fire brigade running into Ozzy and Sharon's room. We thought, oh, no, you know, it's, it's, it's them. But it, it wasn't, was it? I mean, they were, they were actually asleep. It wasn't, it just happened to register in their room or something. I don't know how that happened. But, um, but that, was, that was that. And then we got the gig, uh, and the Queen would invite us back to the, to Rockingham Palace, to the, to, to a, the, the big room there. And um, for 15 minutes, you're allowed to come back for 15 minutes and have a drink. So we went back and <clears throat> I walked in with Phil Collins and, uh, and Sharon and Ozzy. And we walked in, Sharon and Ozzy went that way and Phil and myself went this way. And Tony Blair came over to me. Oh, Tony, I'm a big fan. Uh, I've got all the Sabbath albums. I play guitar and so Can I introduce you to my wife? Sharon said, sure. yeah, okay. So we did. And in the meantime, I <laughs> As he came over, 
Well, it is, you know. <laughs> to, to ask me something. And he goes, I went, oh, it's Tony Blair. He went, oh, oh, hello. 